Columbia Workshop under the direction of William N. Robeson presents Alice in Wonderland. Tonight, the workshop offers the second part of its experimental radio version of Lewis Carroll's immortal classic, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, with a special musical score composed by Lee Stevens and Paul Scarry. The workshop wishes to thank the many listeners who have expressed their valuable reactions to last week's broadcast, in which was inaugurated this, our first venture into the field of musical experimentation. Your criticisms and comments upon tonight's production will be equally valued. The Columbia Workshop presents Alice in Wonderland. It all started with Alice's curiosity about a white rabbit who hopped by as she and her sister sat by the bank of a stream. Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be late. Before she knew it, Alice was falling down what seemed to be a deep well, at the bottom of which, among other curious creatures, she met a mouse. and a caterpillar. Keep your temper. Outside a little house in the middle of a wood, she encountered a frog dressed in the livery of a footman. I shall sit here on and off for days and days. And inside the little house, a sneezing baby, a cook, and a very ugly duchess. Speak roughly to your little boy and beat him when he sneezes. She had rescued the sneezing baby from the fury of the cook, only to have the baby turn into a pig, and a moment later a Cheshire cat had faded into existence on a limb above her. She had not gone much further before she came upon the house of the March Hare. She's sure it is the right house because the chimneys are shaped like ears and the roof is thatched with fur. There was a table set out under a tree in front of the house and the March Hare and the Hatter were having tea at it. A dormouse is sitting between them, fast asleep. The March Hare and the Hatter are using him as a cushion, resting their elbows on him. They aren't at all anxious to have Alice's company. No more, no more, no more. There's plenty of room, and I'm going to sit down. There, that's the wine. <laughs> I don't see any wine, March Hare. There isn't any. <laughs> then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it. Well, it wasn't very civil of you to sit down without being invited. <laughs> I didn't know it was your table. It's made for a great many more than three. Your hair wants petting. <laughs> you should learn not to make personal remarks, Hatter. It's very rude. Why the raven like a writing desk? <laughs> I'm glad you're going to ask riddles. That'll be fun. I believe I can guess that one. You uh, mean that you think you can find out the answer to it? <laughs> exactly so. Well, then you should say what you mean. <laughs> I do. At least, uh, at least I mean what I say. That's the same thing, you know. Not the same thing a bit. I might just as well say that I see what I eat. It's the same thing as I eat what I see. You might just as well say that I like what I get as the same thing as I get what I like. <laughs> you might. Just as well say that I breathe when I sleep is the same thing as I sleep when I breathe. It is the same thing for you, Dormouse. Oh, I must answer that riddle before they forget it. Now, let me see. Why is a raven like a writing desk? A raven? Writing desk? Raven? What day of the month is it? The, um, the fall. This was just two days wrong. I told you butter wouldn't suit the work. It was the very best butter. <laughs> yes, but some crumbs must have got in as well. You shouldn't have put it in with the bread knife. But it was the best butter. Let me dip it in the tea. 
It might wash the crumbs out. Oh, what a funny watch. It tells the day of the month and doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it? Does your watch tell you what year it is? Of course not. But that's because it stays the same year for such a long time together. Wait. Which is just the case with mine. I don't quite understand you. The door might be asleep again. Oh, no. Oh, no. I heard everything you fellows said. Have you guessed the riddle yet? No, I give up. What's the answer? I haven't the slightest idea. Nor I. <laughs> I think you might do something better with the time than wasting it in asking riddles that have no answer. Ah, if you knew time as well as I do. Talk about wasting it with him. I don't know what you mean. Of course you don't. I dare say you never even spoke to time. Perhaps not, but I know I have to beat time when I learn music. No, that accounts for it. He won't stand beating. I know. He and I quarreled last March, just before he, the March Hare, went mad. You know. <laughs> it was at the great concert given by the Queen of Hearts, and I had to sing. Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you rat. You know the song, perhaps? I've heard something like it. It goes on, you know, in this way. <coughs> Up above the world you fly, like a tea tray in the Twinkle, 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 tw
Oh, consider, my dear. She's only a child. She has a head change. Oh, but my, my dear consort. Mind your own. Hmm? Oh, uh, uh, yes, my dear. On with the procession. For the present child, you may keep your head. That's dreadfully kind of you. The procession continued to the fountains in the center of the garden, while Alice looked about her vainly for some way of escape, but the queen kept constantly by her side. Have you seen the mock turtle yet? No. I don't even know what a mock turtle is. It's the thing mock turtle soup is made from. I never saw one or heard of one. Come on, then, and he shall tell you his story. After a little walk, the Queen and Alice came upon a griffin lying fast asleep in the sun. If you don't know what a griffin is, there's very little use in telling you, or you wouldn't believe it anyway. He is sort of half lion, half eagle, half... Hmm. I knew you wouldn't believe it. Oh, lazy thing! And take this young lady to see the mock turtle and to hear his story. I must go back and see after some executions. Uh, what fun? What is the fun? Why, she... It's all her fancy that they never execute nobody, you know. Come on. They had not gone far before they saw the mock turtle in the distance sitting sad and lonely on a little ledge of rock. And as they came nearer, Alice could hear him sighing as if his heart would break. She pitied him deeply. Oh, so what is his sorrow? It's all his fancy that he hasn't got no sorrow, you know. Uh, this here young lady, uh, she wants for to know your history, she do. <laughs> I'll tell her. Sit down, both of you, and don't speak a word till I'm finished. I don't see how he can ever finish if he doesn't begin. Once, I was a real turtle. When we were little, we went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle. We used to call him Tortoise. Why did you call him Tortoise? If he was a turtle. We called him Tortoise because he tortoise. Really, you're very dull. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for asking such a simple question. <laughs> uh, drive on, old fellow. <laughs> uh, don't be all day about it. <laughs> yes, yes. We went to school in the sea. Though you may have believed it. I never said I didn't. You did. Hold your tongue, little girl. <laughs> yes. We had the best of education. In fact, we went to school every day. I've been to day school, too. What did you study? Reeling and writhing, of course, to begin with. And then the different branches of arithmetic. Ambitious distraction, and uglification, and derision. <laughs> and what else had you to learn? Well, there was mystery. Mystery, ancient and modern, with geography. Then drawling. The drawling master was an old conger eel that used to come once a week. He taught us drawling. Stretching and facing in coils. <laughs> what was that like? Uh, well, I can't show it to you myself. I'm too stiff. And the griffin never learned it. They hadn't time. I went to the classical master, though. He was an old crab. He was. I never went to him. He taught laughing and grieving. <laughs> oh, he did. 
And how many hours a day did you do lessons? Ten hours the first day, nine the next, and so on. What a curious plan. That's the reason they are called lessons, because they lessen from day to day. Then the eleventh day must have been a holiday. Of course it was. And how did you manage on the twelfth? That's enough about lessons. Uh, uh, tell her something about the games now. Uh, oh, must I really? Yes, you must. Oh, all right. It, you may not have lived much under the sea. Oh, I haven't. And perhaps you were never even introduced to a lobster. I want tasted like... Oh, mm -hmm. uh, no, never, never. So you can have no idea what a delightful thing a lobster quadrille is. <laughs> no, indeed. What sort of a dance is it? Why, you first form into a line <laughs> along the seashore. Uh, two lines. Seal, turtle, salmon, and so on. Then, when you've cleared all the jellyfish out of the way... That generally takes some time. You advance twice. Each with a lobster as a partner. Of course. Advance twice, set the partners. Change lobsters and retire in same order. Then you know you throw the lobsters as far out to sea as you can. Swim after them. Turn the some salt in the sea. Change lobsters again. Back to land again. And... That's all there is to the first figure. <laughs> it, it must be a very pretty dance. Yes. Uh, would you like to see a little of it? Oh, very much indeed. Oh, come, let's try the first figure, Griffin. We can do it without the lobsters, you know. Oh, which you sing? Uh, you sing. I've forgotten the words. So they began solemnly dancing around and round Alice, every now and then treading on her toes when they passed too close and waving their forepaws to mark the time while the mock turtle sang. Walk a little faster, said a waiting to a snail. There's a porpoise close behind us, and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and the turtles all advance. They are waiting on the shingle. Will you come and join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, will you join the dance? to have him with them. No wise fish would go anywhere without a pauper. Wouldn't it really? Of course not. Why, if a fish came to me and told me he was going on a journey, I should say, with what paupers? Oh, don't you mean purpose? I mean what I say. Uh, uh, shall we try another figure of the uh, lobster quadrille? Or would you like the mock turtle to sing you uh, another song? Oh, a song, please. If the mock turtle would be so kind. Um, no accounting for tastes. Um, uh, sing her turtle soup, will you, old fella? Beautiful soup, so rich and green, waiting in the Come on, 
It's time to go to the trial. What trial? Come on. Come on. And the griffin grabbed Alice by the hand and hurried her off without waiting for the end of the mock turtle song. By the time Alice and the griffin had arrived at the courtroom, a great crowd had assembled there. All sorts of little birds and beasts, as well as the whole pack of cards. The knaves stood before the court in chains. The white rabbit, dressed in the livery of a herald, was near the throne where the king and queen of hearts were sitting. The king is also the judge, by the way. And as he is wearing his crown over his wig, he does not look at all comfortable. And it certainly isn't becoming. In the very middle of the court, on a table, was a large dish of tarts. It made Alice hungry to look at them. I wish they'd get the trial done and hand round the refreshment. No chance of that. Them tarts is what the trial's all about. What are the jurors writing on their plates for? They can't have anything to put down yet before the trial's begun. They're writing down their names for fear they shall forget them before the end of the trial. Stupid things. Why, they're all writing stupid things on their plates. And look, several of them can't spell it correctly. Violence in the court. Um, Harold, uh, read the accusation. <clears throat> Consider your verdict, Jory. No, 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 not yet, not yet, Your Majesty. There's a great deal to come before that. Oh, all right, then. Call the first witness. First witness, the hatter, sometimes called Dad. I beg your pardon, Your Majesty, for bringing my tea and bread and butter with me. But I hadn't quite finished when I was sent for. Well, you, you uh, ought to have finished. Um, when did you begin? 14th of March, I think it was. Mm. <laughs> 15th. 15th. Oh, uh, write that down. The jury is writing down all three dates on their slate. Now they add them up. And now they're reducing the answer to shillings and pence. Only all the answers are different. Just at this moment, Alice felt a very curious sensation which she recognized at once. She was beginning to grow again. She decided, however, to remain in the courtroom as long as there was room for her. However, the dormouse who was sitting next to her objected at once. I wish you wouldn't squeeze so I can hardly breathe. I can't help it. I'm growing. You've got no right to grow here. Don't talk nonsense. You're growing too. Yes, but I grow at a reasonable rate, not in that ridiculous fashion. The hatter is so nervous under the gaze of the queen that he shakes himself out of both his shoes. And in his confusion, he bites the large piece out of his teacup instead of his bread and butter. I'm a poor man, your majesty. You're a very poor speaker. Well, have you executed on the spot? Uh, I'd rather finish my tea. Oh, yes, yes, your, your, your tea. <laughs> uh, in, in, in that case, you may go. Uh, yes, your majesty, I'm going to And I'm just going. take his head off outside. Oh, yes, yes, yes uh, his head. Call the next witness. Alice, what? Me? Yes, you. Well, uh, what do you know about this business, eh? Nothing. Nothing whatever? Nothing whatever. Oh, that's very important. Unimportant, Your Majesty, means important. Unimportant, of course, I meant that, that important, unimportant, that unimportant. Some of the jury write important and some unimportant, but it doesn't really matter. Silence. I, I read from the, the rule. The rule of 42. All persons more than a mile high to leave the court. I'm not a mile high. Oh, yes, you are. Nearly two miles high. See? Well, 
I shan't go at any rate. Besides, that's not a regular rule. You invented it just now. But uh, it's the oldest rule in the book. Then it ought to be number one. Well, it's... Uh, Consider your verdict. No, no, there's more evidence to come yet, please, Your Majesty. Oh. This paper has not been picked up. What in it? I haven't opened it yet, but it seems to be a letter written by the prisoner to, uh, to somebody. Well, it, it must have been that, uh, unless it was written to nobody, uh, which uh, isn't at all usual, you know. Well, the director, it isn't directed at all. In fact, there's nothing written on the outside. Oh, it isn't a matter after all. It's a set of verses. And they in the prisoner's handwriting? No, they're not. Oh, he, he must have imitated somebody else's hand. That yes. proves his guilt. Go off with his hand. It doesn't prove anything of the sort. Why, you don't even know what the verses are about. Oh, uh, uh, read them. Where shall I begin, please, Your Majesty? Um, uh, uh, begin anywhere and, and stop uh, when you like. She gave me a good character, but said I could not swim. He sent them word I had not gone. We knew it to be true. If she should push the matter off, what would become of you? I gave her one. They gave him two. You gave us three or more. They all returned from him to you, though they were mine before. I think that's about enough, Your Majesty. Oh, that's the most important piece of evidence we've heard yet. <laughs> so, uh, now let the jury... I don't believe there's an atom of meaning in it. Hmm? Oh, uh, <laughs> if there's no meaning in it, Alice, that saves a, a world of trouble, you know, as we needn't try to find any. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I don't know. I seem to find there's some meaning here. Hmm. Said I could not swim. Well, uh, you can't swim, can you, Mary? Do I look like him? He certainly doesn't, being made entirely of cardboard. Well, all right so far. <coughs> now continue. Um, we know it to be true. Uh, that's the jury, of course. Uh, if she should push the matter on. Oh, that, that must be the queen. Uh... What would become of you? Yes, what, what indeed. <laughs> I gave her one. They gave him two. Why, why, why that must be what he, he did with the tarts, you know. <laughs> but it goes on. They all return from him to you. Well, uh, well, well, there they are. And so they are. The tarts are on the table. Uh, nothing can be clearer than that, eh? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, then again, um, uh, before she had this fit... Well, uh, uh, you never had fits, did you, my dear consort? Never! Off with somebody's, anybody's head! Uh, then the words don't fit you. <laughs> oh, that's uh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, let, let the jury consider that verdict. No, no, that is first verdict afterwards. That's a nonsense. The idea of having the sentence first. Hold your tongue. I won't. Talk with our hands. But nobody moves for Alice who is now her full size and much too large for them to try to do anything about it, stands up, dumping the jury box and its occupant onto the courtroom floor. Who cares for you? You're nothing but a pack of cards. At this, the whole pack goes up into the air and came flying down upon her. She gave a little scream, half of fright, half of anger, and tried to beat them off. Then she found herself lying on the bank with her head in the lap of her sister, who was gently brushing away some dead leaves that had fluttered down from the trees upon her face. Wake up. Wake up, Alice, dear. Oh, what a long sleep you have. Oh, oh sister, I've had such a glorious dream. All about a, a white rabbit and a mock turtle. And the Mad Hatter, and the Queen of Hearts, and a whole pack of cards. And so ends the Colossal Workshop's dramatization of Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Alice is played by Helen Clare. William N. Ropes and adapted and directed the production. Lee Stevens and Paul Starrett wrote the original musical score, and Mr. Stevens conducted the orchestra. Tune in next week at the same time for another workshop presentation under the direction of Irving Reese. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.